Okay. Let's uh, think about these things. Let me remind you of um, what we've been looking at. Um, we've been going through the history and got into, of course, uh, the CRC history because the URC really comes out of the CRC. And so that it was important that we know that history. And uh, uh, starting in, uh, you know, I'd say the late 40s, there was sort of the beginnings, I would say, of um, the degeneration of the CRC, just kind of started seeing things that were of concern. And uh, we looked at a number of those things. And then, um, and then where, what I'm doing now is because of those, those areas uh, of uh, degeneration or of um, the CRC's disintegration or decline, um, certain things started rising up that caused concern among those who, you know, we could say are the, were conservative, uh, or those who were confessional. Um, and one of those concerns we looked at last time was uh, theistic evolution, uh, evolution itself, uh, but also theistic evolution. And we, uh, I simply concluded last time saying um, you could be a, um, a member, an office bearer, a teacher in the CRC today holding to a theistic evolution and be in good standing. That you know, that's where uh, that's where the CRC is at re regarding that. And so that was a great concern among those who you know, you know, believe that God created the world according to what we read in Genesis one and through three, and uh, that uh, that mankind is creating God's image, and that that is a unique and and uh, important you know matter of to hold to. So. Anyway, um, the, and as I said before, going through these things, I'm going through them sort of historically. I, I'm not delving into the specific issues themselves. Um, I think we'll do that uh, throughout the course of this time. But right now, I'm just looking at what happened that caused there to be concerns that ultimately resulted in the formation of the URC. So that's so just kind of going through it that way. So, uh, so the first one was evolution, theistic evolution. The second one we're going to talk about is uh, homosexuality. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, already in 1973, there was a report uh, brought to Synod called Report 42 on homosexuality. So the matter was definitely already a, a living matter in 1972 or 73, I'm sorry, 1973. And uh, what this report said, I'm going to uh, just quote a, num a couple of things. Um, so that homosexuality, male and female, is a condition of disordered sexuality which reflects the brokenness of our sinful world and for which the homosexual, the homosexual may himself bear only minimal responsibility. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of important, and that was sort of the, 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 the tenor of the whole report. Here's, later on it says this, uh, it, the report, quote, It is important to understand that homosexuality is not the result of any conscious choice or decision on the part of the person to be homosexuality, just as the heterosexual person does not become heterosexual, heterosexual because at a certain age he determines to be so. Whether a person becomes homosexual because of some innate condition or because of early, his early environment and his response to this environment or because of a combination of these, the fact is he is not responsible insofar for his resulting homosexuality. And so what this report continued to do was um, repeatedly made the point that the homosexual person struggling with homosexuality is not responsible. And therefore, no repentance is necessary, right? That's, 
sort of follows. The report also made a distinction of being of homosexuality and homosexualism. Uh, so there was that specific distinction made in the report. Homosexualism is the explicit homosexual practice. And the report did say that that must be condemned as incompatible with obedience to the will of God as revealed in Holy Scripture. Um, so it made this uh, you know, great distinction between the practice, the acts of homosexuality, and the condition of it. Okay, um, that's in 73. So all, all that does is it shows that the, the matter was alive. It was happening. It was being discussed. It was in, in you know, the, uh, the, the mindset uh, of the CRC back then. In 1992, um, a uh, pastor in the CRC, his name is Jim Lucas, uh, held a conference at Calvin College entitled, What Would You Say If I Told You I Was Gay? So just an ordained pastor in the CRC puts on this conference at Calvin College. What would you say if I told you I was gay? That was the name of the conference. You won't be surprised if during the course of this conference, he actually says, I am gay. <laughs> so it's not just a matter of hypothetical. It became a matter of reality. Um, and he said that because he was celibate, that he was in line with the church's position of report, uh, report 42 in 1973. So he, he was... He'd, he recognized himself as a homosexual, but he was not involved in homosexualism, using the language of the, the report. And so he says he was openly, uh, or that he was uh, uh, within the line, uh, or within the, uh, uh, the church's position, and uh, he was, so he was a homosexual, but not practicing. Um, so he was the first openly gay minister in the CRC and began a group, headed up a group entitled As We Are, As We Are, uh, or AWARE, A-W-A-R-E, As We Are. And, uh, uh, and that was a group that was, um, you know, sort of a place where those struggling with, well, maybe I shouldn't say struggling, those with homosexuality could find a place. Uh, within the church, in the CRC. What's that? Uh, we're in the early 90s. Early 90s. Um, and uh, he was never disciplined for his position, uh, but he later chose to leave the CRC. Just a point of interest. Um, in 1997... So I'm going through where the CRC is at with this. In 1997, already the, the URC had begun. So, but, but just to let you know where things, are, we, things were, that were happening. In 1997, uh, there was a religion professor, uh, Phil Haltrup, at Calvin College. And he said, it's possible to read the Bible to allow for homosexual practice and called on Calvin, the Calvin campus to be a safe and welcoming place for homosexual people. Um, this matter was brought back to CRC synods throughout the years um, in 2002, 2005, 2013. In 2016, a study report came out on ministering to homosexuals and uh, focused on three things that report did. First, uh, can a minister officiate a homosexual wedding? Second, can a minister participate at a homosexual wedding? So maybe not officiate, but participate. And then third, can same-sex couples participate in the life of the church as members in good standing? Okay, so those are the three things that this report 
there was a majority report came out and a minority report. And the majority uh, allowed for A and B. In other words, said that a minister could officiate and participate in a homosexual wedding uh, and said that uh, C, you know, whether a homosexual couple can live in the life of the church in, in good standing, uh, that is up to the local church. So that's what the, that's what the majority report said. The minority uh, disallowed for A and B, so it said that that was not um, appropriate. A minister should not officiate or participate. Um, and that the same-sex couples could not be members in good standing. Um, Synod actually adopted the minority. So that's uh, in 2016, uh, the minority report, which was the better one, uh, in my estimation, um, by, a, by a, a majority of 110 to 71 at that, at that synod. Um, but they appointed another study committee on human sexuality. Now, just I'll bring you up to speed. That study committee report was taken up this past summer. Um, and... Uh, uh, the CRC ended up making some very good decisions regarding human sexuality, including that um, that uh, the seventh commandment uh, forbids all unchastity, and that homosexual practice is unchaste. So it's a breaking of the seventh commandment. Uh, you know, uh, among other things, you know, but that's, that's what they said. Um, now, interestingly enough, Tom was just telling me this morning uh, that there's a local CRC in Denver um, where people are uh, objecting to that very issue. Objecting to the fact, don't want to say that the homosexual engaged in homosexual practice is breaking the seventh commandment. They don't want to say that. So, um, quite, you know, quite a serious. The matter, even though the, CR, the Senate made a good decision, there's a lot of uproar coming in, you know, from the churches. And so, uh, the, that final issue has not been, you know, we'll see where that leads. We'll see where that leads. But anyway, um, so that's, that's uh, the issue of homosexuality. Um, a third, a third concern would be that of worship. Now, I would say that this concern is more of, uh, more a, um, I may put it, informal concern. In other words, the evolution, homosexuality, and women in office, these were issues that actually were brought to Synod, and decisions were made at Synod, and there were, there were you know, things about what, you know, we would say, no, this is wrong because of decisions. Worship is not so much one of those things, um, and that's, that's why I say informal. It, 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 there's not like formal decisions that we were up against, but, um, but we believe that our confessions teach what we would hold to the regulative principle of worship. Uh, that is that we worship God in no other way than he has commanded in his word. That, that the other, you know, the, the other option is as long as God hasn't forbidden, we may do it. Okay? Well, we don't find in Scripture that God has forbidden bringing clowns into church, and so we can bring clowns into church. Um, you know, the, the, you see the difference. Um, we believe, and our confessions teach, that uh, we worship God in no other way than He has commanded in His Word. That's precisely, by the way, the wording of the Heidelberg Catechism on the Second Commandment, that we worship God in no other way than He has commanded in His Word. So it's a confessional matter uh, for us. We also hold to a, a dialogical approach to worship, um, and that just simply means that it, worship is, is God's people meeting with and worshiping God, and that our worship is dialogical, where there are some parts of our worship where God is speaking to us, like when the word is read, 
um, or when, uh, you know, the, the pastor raises his hand and gives a, a benediction or a uh, 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 call to worship or these kind of things. Um, God is speaking to us. And then there's responses, like when we sing, when we pray, you know, so that there's, it's a dialogue that's happening in worship. Okay, so that's, that's we understand that. Um, that's well understood. Um, and that's standard, I would say, Reformed worship. Starting in the 70s, or at least uh, it, became, it, it, it became evident in the 70s and onward, there were some CRC churches that took on a more charismatic um, style of worship. Um, some of them went quite charismatic. Uh, some of them ended up leaving the CRC just because they wanted to go fully, you know, uh, charismatic. Um, in the 1980s, a lot of more of what we would call contemporary worship started coming in uh, to the churches. And uh, so it's, it's not, you know, bringing in like praise bands and, and uh, uh, worship being much more informal, um, much less liturgical uh, was all happening in, in the 1980s. So all of this was taking place. Further, the CRC Board of Home Missions would send pastors and home missionaries to um, Willow Creek leadership uh, conferences. Uh, if you're familiar with that, that's Bill Hybels. Uh, again, a very um, contemporary sort of approach. Or uh, to the Crystal Cathedral with uh, Robert Schuller. Uh, there were, you know, uh, Robert Schuller church planting stuff. Um, and uh, that was very disturbing, um, that the, the, the CRC was actually paying money to send pastors to Bill Hybels and Robert Schuller. Um, all of that was for matters of worship. And, uh, and so that was a great concern. Um, maybe let me see if there's any questions on, on, on those two matters. Because I'm going to shift gears a little bit right now. Because as I go through the women in office issue, I'm, I want to do it uh, at the same time of going through the women's office issue, I want to really bring out what was happening that brought about the, the, the URC. So I'm I'm, I'm going to start now really focusing on the, what, how the URC began. I've told you before, in uh, 1967, there was the Harold Decker case, which was the love of God controversy where he sort of questioned uh, uh, limited atonement or, uh, you know, the, the L of our tulip. Uh, that, in other words, that the love of God was uh, for everybody and that Christ died for everybody rather than for his elect. And he was questioning that in 1968 uh, began um, the Association of Christian Reformed Laymen, uh, the ACRL, the Association of Christian Reformed Laymen. That was formed in 1968. They were already in 68 concerned about the direction of the CRC. And so they formed this. It was laymen, not pastors, which is just interesting to note. And... Uh, their goal was to challenge and encourage the faculty of Calvin Seminary and clergy to remain faithful to the Word of God and to our confessions. So that was their goal, to, to really focus on the faculty of Calvin Seminary and the clergy. That's why they were called the laymen. In 1970, um, this is just an interesting, um, a conservative pastor... Uh, named uh, uh, Pastor Licatesi. He was actually um, Italian, um, but he was a pastor of Godwin Heights CRC in Wyoming, Michigan. That's out, just outside of Grand Rapids. Um, he resigned and left Godwin Heights and left the CRC, uh, Vincent Licatesi, and, uh, uh, because he was concerned about where the CRC was headed. Uh, but he also didn't want to split his local church. So he just simply resigned. Um, but he started leading services on Sunday mornings 
um, sort of on his own, so he kind of, you know, that is concerning, but nonetheless it was happening in the greater Grand Rapids area. And sometimes he would draw more than a thousand people to those services. Now this is in 1970. So you start thinking about that. Things are not going too well. And, and you know, I mean, for, for him to draw, he, to leave the CRC, a pastor in good standing, leaves the CRC, resigns, and starts t- teaching and preaching. And a thousand people in the greater Grand Rapids area come to listen to him. Um, it says, hmm, there might not be as much unity in the CRC as we might have thought. Um, so I just bring that up. Uh, it's an early indication that, that there's some division going on uh, in the CRC. Uh, in 1970, so we're back now to the 70s, the, uh, uh, the Synod appointed a committee, another study committee, uh, to uh, study the matter of women as office bearers in the church. What is interesting about that is it was not, that did not come out of a church requesting it. It didn't come even out of a uh, sort of a standing committee requesting that the church do this, that the Synod do this. It came from the Gerefemir de Kerk in the Netherlands. The GKN, uh, they, they had approved women in office by that time, and they encouraged the CRC Synod to study that issue. <laughs> and the CRC did it. Um, that would not, by the way, happen in the URC. In the URC, we're pretty strict that the Synod only deal with matters that are brought by the churches of this URC, okay? So um, we're, we wouldn't have somebody from the outside tell us to do something, and we do it. Um, so just uh, that's, that's a little bit of an aside. But nonetheless, that's what happened. And um, so this was 1970. In 1970, so we have in 1970 this pastor leaving. You have this uh, committee uh, that is appointed to study the matter of women in office, in 1970, the, uh, a magazine started called The Torch and Trumpet. And The Torch and Trumpet um, began as a sort of a conservative uh, alternative to the CRC's The Banner, which was, it's, the banner was the CRC magazine. Um, and, um, and that was the first time in writing where the editor of The Torch and Trumpet said, who used to be an editor of The Banner, but, now, but he was on the conservative side, and he said, the thought, quote, the, the, now just get the timing here, 1970, the thought of withdrawal from the CRC is no longer an academic or theoretical matter. <laughs> so just the, the, the idea of withdrawing from the CRC now is, has gone beyond just an academic discuss, discussion or a theoretical discussion. We've gotten, we've gotten beyond that. So already in 1970, there's that sentiment. Um, And by the way, just uh, for your information, in 1981, the Torch and Trumpet changed their name to the Outlook magazine. Some of you are familiar with the Outlook magazine. Um, It's put out by Reformed Fellowship. I used to be on the board of Reformed Fellowship when I lived in the in the uh, Michigan um, who put out the Outlook magazine. So I was very involved in that uh, earlier earlier on. But anyway, um, in 1973, that report uh, came before Synod. Uh, report 39. What am I doing on time? Okay, a, few, a couple more minutes. In Report 39, 1973, that report said this, quote, the practice of excluding women from ecclesiastical office cannot be conclusively defended on biblical grounds. So the practice of excluding women from ecclesiastical office cannot be conclusively defended on biblical grounds. And they argue that Paul's then restrictions uh, on office were, quote, local, cultural, and therefore temporal. So local, cultural, and therefore temporal. Okay, does that... The groundwork is being laid, okay? Just, uh, you know, this is how, how the, that works. Um, the report 
was uh, referred to the churches. So Synod didn't, uh, for, Synod didn't adopt or not adopt. They just referred the report to the churches. But that Synod also appointed another committee to respond to this report and make recommendations. So that, that came back in 1975. In 1975, um, the Synod rejected the committee's recommendation to open all the offices to women. So already that there was a committee that said, let's open the offices. Synod rejected that, but by a slim 57% majority. Um, so clearly there's division. Uh, the majority was on the, you would say, the conservative side, but uh, not a great majority. Um, they said that Synod would not open all offices to women, uh, get, quote, unless compelling biblical grounds are advanced. And at that time, uh, the certain women formed the organization Committee for Women in the CRC, the CWCRC, Committee for Women in the CRC. Um, and uh, they had, you know, the banner editor, uh, Kyvan Hoven was on their side. The seminarian professors like Corn Cornelius Planninga and Mel Hugan were on their side, and many clergy was on their side. And for years, there was this back and forth you know, uh, there seemed to be like, oh, they're going to open the offices to women, and then, oh, no, Synod said, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, but that, you know, majority got less and less and so forth. And uh, um, this group, the Committee for Women in the CRC, um, really just had one, one issue. Let's get the offices open to women. That, I mean, that was why they existed. Um, one pastor said, this is feminist politicking in the, in the CRC. Um, Senate 1978 voted to open the office of deacon to women, uh, but that wasn't ratified in Senate 79. So already back then, right, we're there. Uh, Senate 79, um, in, in 1979, more churches uh, left the CRC. So... Uh, um, yeah. You know what? I'm going to stop there. Our time is our time is up. But uh, um, so we're we, we're come to the end of night of the 1970s, and there are churches that are leaving at that point. Uh, who um, some of those churches that left at that point would later come into the URC, um, but they they started the uh, a, a federation of. A uh, church is called the Orthodox Christian Reformed Church. Um, that never came of, nothing much came of that, just to let you know. So anyway, I'm going to stop there and uh, get ourselves ready for this, our uh, catechetical service.